on a related note, if I may ask you, it seems that um, even though the British were sent packing, um, they left behind some sort of a language of deeply <laughs> colonized spokespeople to somehow continue doing their dirty work for them. Um, and you've spoken on these lines in the past as well in our interviews. These people, uh, if I may say, are extremely ignorant about our heritage and reality as well. And yet they feel so sure about the nonsense they purvey, right? So how long does it take before these brown sahibs uh, also are history? It will take a while. Uh, my own analysis of countries that were colonies suggests that it takes three generations to overcome that. Let me give you some examples from my own personal experience. I remember as a child in the 50s, I would see my grandfather dress up every morning, take his, put on his turban, take his walking stick and go off somewhere. And whenever he came back in the evening looking very tired, exhausted and frustrated, uh, my grandmother would make him tea and sit with him and chat with him. And then one day I asked him, I said, Dada, where are you going looking so different? He said, Beta, we had some property in Pakistan because we were refugees. And there's an exchange of so-called enemy property. We are supposed to get some land in Delhi in lieu of what we had left behind in law. So I asked him, I said, Grandpa, then what happened? His response was, now, he had been led to believe that anything British was far superior to anything that is India. That was the kind of knowledge that was imparted to him. That was a kind of inferiority complex that he was trained to accept. There was also this character called Macaulay, if you remember him, who said that, now, one shelf in an English library has more wisdom than all the tomes of India put together. This kind of rubbish came from these characters. Then came my father's generation who said, right, we were trained by the British, but we have to build new India. Then is my generation. We said, yes, we know that we were a colony, but now we are responsible citizen stakeholders in the future of India. And then comes your generation, my kid's generation, which says, Oh, really? Were we ever a British colony? I don't remember anything like that. They can look anyone in the eye and uh, speak to them with the self-confidence that comes from a resurgent, vibrant, self-confident nation. So it takes three generations. The fourth generation is what makes the break. And that generation has come. Now, I was at the swimming pool recently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now shut down because of the virus. We have a lovely heated pool. Right. And there was somebody who came up to me and said, you know, Whenever you next go to London, um, whenever you next go to England, I didn't hear him very clearly what he said. Uh, we have a lovely apartment in Grosvenor Square. So I kind of looked at him and I said, I didn't know there was a governor's square in the nation's capital, New Delhi. He said, no, no, I'm talking of London. I said, sir, I've never been to London, nor do I intend to, but thank you very much. So you see what happens. All these guys who've cheated India, all kinds of crooks, thugs, gangsters, this Malaiwala fellow who owned an airline, this Hira Moti character who says he was a diamond dealer, other characters, one chap who was fixing cricket matches, all these chaps who do funny things, they all run off to England and they get refuge there. And yeah. then the British give us lectures on probity and on uh, honesty, on integrity, on transparency, etc. They have no hesitation in hiding behind their so-called rules and regulations to keep these people there as long as these jokers have money to spend. The moment their money runs out, they'll be sent out. <laughs> Let me tell you something also which is very interesting. You might remember that a former British Prime Minister who lost her job to the present chap who looks like somebody out of some strange uh, event. <laughs> uh, um, she, I think it was a lady called Theresa May, and I yeah. did get a chance to interact with some of her people. And the, the, the question about uh, this... Uh, fellow who owned an airlines, this Malaiwala character, was raised that, will you send him back to us? You know th what this official told me, and I will not take names because there is uh, a certain amount of trust, there's a certain amount of commitment and confidentiality. He said to me, he said, buy our warplanes rather than the Rafals. We'll put Malaiwala on the first one back to India. It was the French revolutionary, I think, Bertrand Le Barrer, who, who had said, the British are a nation of shopkeepers. 
buy from them, they'll sell their souls. So if Mr. Malaiwala thinks that they are keeping him there because of some sense of British justice, total arrant nonsense. They are keeping him there because it yeah. suits them too, because he has invested money there. Now I believe the Swiss have taken over one of the huge villas that he owned. They'll also slowly take away all the other properties he has. Once he's broke, they'll send him right back to India because then he has no further use. And then they have no further use for him. So I just wanted to say that these brown sahibs in India should understand that era has gone. You know, this is Amrit Mahotsav, 75. This is 75th year of independence. This is a new resurgent India. It has an economy larger than that of Britain. Its voice is heard with rapt attention wherever we speak. Another example, some years ago, there was an election to the International Criminal Court. India's candidate was a person, outstanding legal luminary called Justice Dalbir Bhandari. He's still uh, a member of the International Criminal Court. And at that point of time, the British had their own candidate. Now, in the UN Security Council, which has to approve the candidates, we had, uh, well, the British and then the Americans, the French, we have three Europeans and we had Russia and we have China. Now, they went around saying that the, the majority in the Security Council supports our candidate, and so the Indian candidate is withdrawing. We said, nothing like this, buddy, we're not withdrawing. So we went to the UN General Assembly. We asked for a vote. The British also went to the UN General Assembly and said, well, guys, are you going to vote for my chap or for the Indian candidate? And I believe out of the 193 members of the General Assembly, um, uh, around 190 said, we are going to vote for the Indian candidate. So this would have led to a direct confrontation between the Security Council and the General Assembly, with the General Assembly prevailing. This really frightened the other members of the UN Security Council, that if we say or do something, pass a resolution, it can be challenged in the General Assembly, which means it would have become a precedent. So what do you think happened? The British announced that their chap, who till the previous evening was drinking and enjoying himself merrily, had suddenly fallen ill and was withdrawing from the contest. I mean, that was the first time that I know of in an international organization we gave a stunning slap to the British. They should recognize this. They do. They do recognize it, but they don't accept it. That is their problem. So the greatest empire builders, we, the greatest empire busters. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit CITTI.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.